Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Nicole West Burns. I am officially the coordinator for the Toronto Writing Project Spring Institute. And um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our third, third, can you believe it, third annual event. And so glad that you could be with us today. So I get the lucky task of introducing um, Hilary Jenks, uh, one of the most influential critical literacy educators in the world and also my friend. Um, so grateful to have you here. Um, Hilary is Professor Emeritus at the Witz School of Education, University of the Witz Watersland in Johannesburg, South Africa. She's worked as a teacher and teacher educator for over 40 years. It's important to remember that literacy is not just text in a vacuum. It's always in a context. And the context critically affects meaning. A way of helping you think about that text in a different way. You know, who's disempowered by that text? Whose interests are served? Who benefits? Who doesn't benefit? Who gets access to food or medical care? Who doesn't get access? Who decides? Critical literacy has to move with the way in which representation, constructions, texts encode power, and you have to think about whose interests are served all the way through. She's so rigorous, I think, in, in her approach uh, to critical literacy and thinking, always thinking about the kind of political implications, especially around power with literacy. And um, for me, I think a lot about uh, the sort of poetry communities that I'm a part of and the ways in which uh, I think many poets seem intuitively to be uh, critical of systems of power and so that's um, at play in the in the poetry world. So in what Hillary was saying this morning we read with the text but we can also read against it right so that's sound was one of the ways we read against this so let's um, Maybe you can read this by yourself first. I'll take you through how we worked with the kids. And the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted, above all, like the old joke, to shove... We have to follow now her rhythm mm -hmm. of reading it. Yeah, Sound is, is, like is shifting how time passes, right? So when you're reading on your own, you're following your own rhythm. And then once something's out loud, time That's is starting true. to, like... Temporal mm. stuff starts to happen. Yeah. In a school context, often poetry is seen as kind of like um, on the hier highest on the hierarchy of ways that language gets used, and poets are valorized, and especially old dead white poets, like Shakespeare and uh, and that sort. Um, and there's a real disconnect between that version of poetry and the like active critical poetry happening today. The thing that really inspires me with this type of work is just how differently situated educators are when they come in and the ideas they bring. So there are times when we can be in our kind of silos within our practice and we're often um, pressured through institutional and bureaucratic demands and um, we can make those, forge those critical relationships with our students, but sometimes we don't have the horizontal capacity to speak sideways and, and to learn within these vast networks of educators and writers about the complexities of our practice. So I think what this work does for us is it makes us understand that there's some deep things happening with texts and there's deep things happening in the creative process of writing. And, and until we kind of really get the opportunity to muck about and play around with new things, then the writing pedagogy won't change and we'll be stuck with the same text-based handout kind of rigid formulas for writing and and this Toronto Writing Project has given us opportunities to see the vast array of different social practices. It's not just about sort of um, decoding what's on the page because we know that this is devoid of context and you know if, if there's not if it's not put in a context it doesn't mean much of anything but even inviting students into the conversation we were having earlier about why are we reading this? Who decided this? Well, are there other stories that are not here, right? But that's actually part of critical literacy work. So this session was thinking about uh, the literary canon, whatever that means. And actually, that was sort of what we were trying to do, is sort of, well, what does that actually mean? Um, which is this idea that there are groups of typically books, not other kinds of texts, but typically books, um, that are put together. And, and the idea is that 
people should read these because it's going to make them into particular kinds of citizens. Um, so everybody, for example, should read a Shakespeare play because they're going to know something about uh, important universal, quote unquote, universal themes of, of the way people are, and they're also going to engage in some kind of cultural experience that's going to give them particular kinds of linguistic and intellectual and, and sort of political orientations to the world. But it was, it was interesting because then we had to really ask ourselves questions about how do you decide, right? Is it based on the kind of story you want told? Is it based on the who's telling the story? Uh, is it based on wanting to have different kinds of uh, linguistic and uh, social and economic uh, and political experiences that are in the space and, and in the text that we're talking about? Like how do we complicate this notion of whose li literacies do we teach and whose privilege and power are we questioning? Because sometimes it's not easy when the frame gets turned on to who and how we represent ourselves in the world. It's, I think those are really good questions to have and, and, to, and to encourage. And so that's where the inquiry comes in and that's where the fun happens. So um, we all have like really creative students in our class and we know that they love sound and music. So his workshop uh, was able to show us how to use sound to interact with text. And like we did a lot of listening exercises and we described the sounds that we were hearing without labeling them, which was really interesting. So like for example, if you're trying to describe wind, you wouldn't say wind, you would say things like soft, whistling, and even go just to like kind of add that sound to it. And I found that really interesting because it could be like a language building activity, like, you know, really focused on like adjectives and things like that to like help students. Okay, well those sound like some phenomenal sessions, things for our own learning um, as educators, but also those kinds of things that might really be impactful for our students. So thank you everyone who led the sessions, thank you to all of the participants, and now what we'll do is move into our afternoon session with our, our featured speaker today, Hillary. Welcome back. When people move into critical literacy, they always think that you have to read against the text. I've always said that you've got to read with the text and you've got to read against the text. If you don't read with the text, you can never learn from a text that you disagree with. Okay, if you shut it out before you've even tried to work out what it's trying to say, you can't learn anything from texts you disagree with making a decision about whether to support the positions offered in a text are not literacy decisions. They're ethical decisions, okay? And I don't think we focus enough on ethics in schools because it's not about you're just automatically going to read the text. It's about reading the text, thinking about who benefits, thinking about the social effects of the text, thinking about whether you want to take up the positions that the text is offering you because you support them as ethical positions or you want to resist them because you think they're unjust. Okay, so it's more about reading against the text. It's both. Urging ourselves to read with a text that we might disagree with in order to understand the perspective better. I feel like that's something that doesn't necessarily come naturally um, to us, but I think it's really important uh, to uh, be able to have those tough conversations with our students and change minds and change perspectives. Lebov's paper, which I still love, called The Logic of Non-Standard English, in which Lebov shows that all varieties of language are all capable of doing deep intellectual work. They can do what the people need them to do. There's no linguistic variety that is better than another linguistic variety. That doesn't mean that socially they are equally valued, okay? Because difference tends to get organized in dominance. And what that means is that difference has become hierarchized. Some are seen as better than others. And so liter new literacies has to take power more seriously, which is one of the reasons why diversity in my model has to be inter interdependent with power. Okay? You have, to, you have to recognize that with diversity, there's hierarchy, and that you have to do something about those hierarchies to ensure that diversity has a place. Okay, you can't just like, do diversity on its own. 
And so she had the one activity where if you can rate languages on a power scale, where would you put them? And it reminds me of Edward Said, who said, language is a dialect with an army. And that, that's all it really is. And so the ways in which we hierarchize language, the ways in which we view beauty through certain prisms, uh, whether it's an accent, whether it's you know a poem, I think that really reminded me that these are social constructs that we're mired in, but there are also things we can play around with and have fun with. So um, that's what I really loved about Hilary Jenks' work too. It has an element of freshness and fun. in relation to threats to the planet. What, what does it look like to you? What did you do with it? Oh, yeah. It's like Oil. a shield to me right now. Looks like a shield. Yeah. Okay. What can you do with a shield to say something about threats to the planet? Um, Nicole said to look to her like a mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. So if I'm looking at my reflection here, I'm looking at it in the black surround. Why has the world suddenly gone black? Okay, so choose your waste, redesign it to make an art statement about consumerism and waste as a threat to the planet. Okay, redesign waste material as a form of social action linked to the slogan reduce, reuse, recycle. These are just prompts, something to do with what we are doing to the planet through an art piece using waste, okay? There are stations that have been set up on the sides. We have paints, we have colorful tapes, we have double-sided tapes, we have scissors, we have exacto knives, we have all of that. I also have scented shrimps and a, a thick Sharpie marker if you want to do any labeling of, of what it is that you're creating. It's easy to have dreams of how great something's going to be when you actually do it physically with your hands, you see some of the complications and some of the um, potential stumbling blocks or, or potential possibilities. And so uh, for us to have a chance as educators to come together and actually try something, um, I think it really grounds it and helps to connect to practices in classrooms or whenever we're educating in community contexts as well, right? So The Spring Institutes really bring in some amazing scholars and to be able to be in dialogue with them and to be in the room with people whose work that I have been reading for years is so exciting and so unique. And especially in the, te in the teaching field where you're in your classroom sometimes, it can be very isolating. It's really wonderful to get those people face to face and to be in that community of learners. I couldn't actually cut through it. Like it took, like I had like a huge, like a huge pair of scissors and I was trying to poke holes into it and I couldn't. And it's so light and it's, it's durable, but I, if I couldn't poke through it with scissors, it's sort of going to what Ben was saying, like the, the thousands of years that it's going to take for this thing to deconstruct is pretty frightening. And it, it makes me think about like how we need to sort of model for our students in our spaces, like trying to reduce plastics, like just simple things like not having plastic plates and cups in spaces where in, um, trying to reduce paper use. Like I think that is is something that is very small but will speak volumes to our students of uh, the values that we have and our, our respect for our space. It's wonderful to work with people who are open to experience and prepared to have a go. Um, I felt like a safe space for people. Um, people were relaxed. Um, I think they've all got a social justice agenda themselves. For Hilary Jenks and her piece around critical literacy, I was really struck with how she actually gets students to analyze um, the water they consume and the bottles that, that come in those packages. And it inspired me to think through how students interact with materials in their day-to-day -day lives. And so I'm kind of eager to look at, for instance, uh, a critical practice, a critical lens on even the clothes we buy. So what would it mean to ask students to look at the tags of each other's clothing and find out where they're produced, how are they manufactured, and then to kind of look up the types of resources uh, that talk about those systems of production, um, whether it's their iPhone, whether it's their, their clothing um, and where they're produced. So it reminds us that we're so deeply enmeshed in um, consumerist culture. And that also provides a lot of critical capacities for, for analyzing <laughs> that and to repositioning ourselves as, as informed consumers and not simply uh, people who are addicted to 
consumption without questioning. So it's better to be uh, addicted to questioning. And of course, there's no outside to consuming, but at least we can consume social practices that are you know, more um, beneficial for society.